Good afternoon, Commander. Hoping for a younger man? The voice chuckled. No, sir, Susan said, embarrassed. It's not how it... Sure it is, he laughed. David Becker's a good man. Don't ever lose him. Thank you, sir. The commander's voice turned suddenly stern. Susan, I'm calling because I need you in here pronto. She tried to focus. It's Saturday, sir. We don't usually... I know, he said calmly. It's an emergency. Susan sat up. Emergency? She'd never heard the word cross Commander Strathmore's lips. An emergency? In crypto? She couldn't imagine. Yes, sir, she paused. I'll be there as soon as I can. Make it sooner. Strathmore hung up. Susan Fletcher stood wrapped in a towel and dripped on the neatly folded clothes she'd set out the night before. Hiking shorts, a sweater for the cool mountain evenings, and the new lingerie she'd bought for the nights. Depressed, she went to her closet for a clean blouse and skirt. An emergency? In crypto? As she went downstairs, Susan wondered how the day could get much worse. She was about to find out. Chapter 2 30,000 feet above a dead calm ocean, David Becker stared miserably from the Learjet 60's small oval window. He'd been told the phone on board was out of order, and he'd never had a chance to call Susan. What am I doing here? he grumbled to himself. But the answer was simple. There were men to whom you just didn't say no. Mr. Becker? the loudspeaker crackled. We'll be arriving in half an hour. Becker nodded gloomily to the invisible voice. Wonderful. He pulled the shade and tried to sleep. But he could only think of her. Chapter 3 Susan's Volvo sedan rolled to a stop in the shadow of the ten-foot-high barbed cyclone fence. A young guard placed his hand on the roof. ID, please. Susan obliged and settled in for the usual half-minute wait. The officer ran her card through a computerized scanner. Finally, he looked up. Thank you, Miss Fletcher. He gave an imperceptible sign, and the gate swung open. Half a mile ahead, Susan repeated the entire procedure at an equally imposing electrified fence. Come on, guys. I've only been through here a million times. As she approached the final checkpoint, a stocky sentry with two attack dogs and a machine gun glanced down at her license plate and waved her through. She followed Canine Road for another 250 yards and pulled into Employee Lot C. Unbelievable, she thought. 26,000 employees and a $12 billion budget. You'd think they could make it through the weekend without me. Susan gunned the car into her reserved spot and killed the engine. After crossing the landscaped terrace and entering the main building, she cleared two more internal checkpoints and finally arrived at the windowless tunnel that led to the new wing. A voice scan booth blocked her entry. National Security Agency, NSA, Crypto Facility, Authorized Personnel Only. The armed guard looked up. Afternoon, Miss Fletcher. Susan smiled tiredly. Hi, John. Didn't expect you today. Yeah, me neither. She leaned toward the parabolic microphone. Susan Fletcher, she stated clearly. The computer instantly confirmed the frequency concentrations in her voice, and the gate clicked open. She stepped through. The guard admired Susan as she began her walk down the cement causeway. He noticed that her strong hazel eyes seemed distant today, but her cheeks had a flushed freshness, and her shoulder-length auburn hair looked newly blown dry. Trailing her was the faint scent of Johnson's baby powder. His eyes fell the length of her slender torso, to her white blouse, with the bra barely visible beneath, to her knee-length khaki skirt, and finally to her legs. Susan Fletcher's legs. Hard to imagine they support a hundred and seventy IQ, he mused to himself. He stared after her a long time. Finally, he shook his head as she disappeared in the distance. As Susan reached the end of the tunnel, a circular vault-like door blocked her way. The enormous letters read, Crypto. Sighing, 
she placed her hand inside the recessed cipher box and entered her five-digit pin. Seconds later, the twelve-ton slab of steel began to revolve. She tried to focus, but her thoughts reeled back to him. David Becker, the only man she'd ever loved, the youngest full professor at Georgetown University and a brilliant foreign language specialist, he was practically a celebrity in the world of academia. Born with an eidetic memory and a love of languages, he'd mastered six Asian dialects, as well as Spanish, French, and Italian. His university lectures on etymology and linguistics were standing room only, and he invariably stayed late to answer a barrage of questions. He spoke with authority and enthusiasm, apparently oblivious to the adoring gazes of his star-struck co-eds. Becker was dark, a rugged, youthful thirty-five with sharp green eyes and a wit to match. His strong jaw and taut features reminded Susan of carved marble. Over six feet tall, Becker moved across a squash court faster than any of his colleagues could comprehend. After soundly beating his opponent, he would cool off by dousing his head in a drinking fountain and soaking his tuft of thick black hair. Then, still dripping, he'd treat his opponent to a fruit shake and a bagel. As with all young professors, David's university salary was modest. From time to time, when he needed to renew his squash club membership or restring his old Dunlop with gut, he earned extra money by doing translating work for government agencies in and around Washington. It was on one of those jobs that he'd met Susan. It was a crisp morning during fall break when Becker returned from a morning jog to his three-room faculty apartment to find his answering machine blinking. He downed a quart of orange juice as he listened to the playback. The message was like many he received, a government agency requesting his translating services for a few hours later that morning. The only strange thing was that Becker had never heard of the organization. They're called the National Security Agency, Becker said, calling a few of his colleagues for background. The reply was always the same. You mean the National Security Council? Becker checked the message. No, they said agency. The NSA. Never heard of them. Becker checked the GAO directory, and it showed no listing either. Puzzled, Becker called one of his old squash buddies, an ex-political analyst turned research clerk at the Library of Congress. David was shocked by his friend's explanation. Apparently, not only did the NSA exist, but it was considered one of the most influential government organizations in the world. It had been gathering global electronic intelligence data and protecting U.S. classified information for over half a century. Only three percent of Americans were even aware it existed. NSA, his buddy joked, stands for no such agency. With a mixture of apprehension and curiosity, Becker accepted the mysterious agency's offer. He drove the thirty-seven miles to their eighty-six-acre headquarters, hidden discreetly in the wooded hills of Fort Meade, Maryland. After passing through endless security checks and being issued a six-hour holographic guest pass, he was escorted to a plush research facility, where he was told he would spend the afternoon providing blind support to the cryptography division, an elite group of mathematical brainiacs known as the Code Breakers. For the first hour, the cryptographers seemed unaware Becker was even there. They hovered around an enormous table and spoke a language Becker had never heard. They spoke of stream ciphers, self-decimated generators, knapsack variants, zero-knowledge protocols, unicity points. Becker observed, lost. They scrawled symbols on graph paper, pored over computer printouts, and continuously referred to the jumble of text on the overhead projector. J-H-D-J-A-3, J-K-H-D-H-M-A-D-O, forward slash E-R-T-W-T, J-L-W, plus J-G-J, 328, and so on. Eventually, one of them explained what Becker had already surmised. The scrambled text was a code, a cipher text, groups of numbers and letters representing encrypted words. The cryptographer's job was to study the code and extract from it the original message, or clear text. The NSA had called Becker because they suspected the original message was written in Mandarin Chinese. He was to translate the symbols as the cryptographers decrypted them. For two hours, Becker interpreted an endless stream of Mandarin symbols. But each time he gave...